So as you can see on the slide, it is the first out of four webinars in our fall webinar series, Shaping Provisioning Systems for Social Ecological Transformation, Decent Care for All Within Planetary Boundaries, which I organized together with my colleagues Fabienne Desieux and Julia Fankhauser for the International Karl Polanyi Society in cooperation with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Brussels. This webinar series puts the inclusive, resilient, and sustainable provisioning of care for all within planetary boundaries into focus, takes stock of pioneering work and recent approaches at the intersection of feminist and ecological research, and foregrounds the relevance of care in addressing the ecological crisis. As I said, I'm very happy that so many of you are here today. And I hope to see many more, or at least many of you back for our next webinars. You can see them here on the slide. I will show them again at the end of the webinar. We're meeting on three Wednesdays, again, six to eight in October and November um, to discuss um, the transition towards a caring society, decent care for all within planetary boundaries and transformative change and changing societies. But um, without further ado, and that's also why I'm going to stop this again now, um, I would like to kick off the first webinar today. Taking advantage of the opportunities at both the sixth Foundational Economy Conference, which starts tomorrow and will take place here in Vienna um, for the next three days, and the 31st network meeting of the Netzwerk Vorsorgen des Wirtschaften, the Network Caring Economy, um, which will happen end of October, take place in Vienna this autumn. The objective of this webinar is to steer a discussion between important figures of the two discourses and to discuss together how unpaid care work or care work more generally, both paid and unpaid care work, builds an invisible foundation of our current societies and how an engagement in feminist research on care can strengthen foundational economy approaches towards a social ecological transformation. Today with me, I have six distinguished speakers. Two of them, Andreas Novi and Richard Berntaler, are here as representatives of the Foundational Economy Collective and are also part of the conference organizing team. And four of them, Ulrike Knobloch, Adelheid Biesecker, Maren Jochemsen, and Anna Sabe, are longstanding and actually, in many cases, founding members of the Network Caring Economy. Before we get our panel started, I would first like to invite Ulrike Knobloch, who is an adjunct professor at the University of Fechter and a founding member, as well as the current chairwoman of the Network Caring Economy, to briefly introduce the Netzwerk Vorsorgen des Wirtschaften to our audience. I would hand over the word to you, Ulrike. Yeah, hello, good evening, everybody. And thank you for the invitation and this kind introduction. I would like to, as Corinna told me, to very briefly introduce the Netzwerk Vorsorgen des Wirtschaften. The Network Caring Economy, how is it translated into English, has emerged from the Women's Working Group at an Ecological Economics Conference 1992 in St. Gallen, Switzerland. Therefore, it could celebrate its 30th anniversary last year. The Network Caring Economy is an association of academics and practitioners from Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, uh, the German-speaking area, we can say or name it. It brings together women who are interested to discuss questions of socially and ecologically sustainable economies and to develop roads to a caring economy and to analyze case studies and best practices. The network meets annually and individual groups of its members also meet in between. In the meantime, the network has about 50 members from which around 20 come to the annual meetings. We have published three books together. <laughs> you can say every decade one, starting with, I hope we can see it, uh, uh, Politische Ökologie und Vorsorgen des Wirtschaften in 1994. 
And in 2000, uh, a book in the Ökom, no, nee, in the uh, Kleine Verlag, um, it is uh, Vorsorgen des Wirtschaften auf dem Weg einer Ökonomie des guten Lebens. And 2013, it was uh, the Wege Vorsorgen des Wirtschaften, Metropolis Publisher. Um, yes, uh, this was uh, the newest uh, articles, uh, but of course we publish uh, in individual groups and uh, uh, single papers, of course, as well. We have, together as a network, we have organized several conferences and workshops and inspired some research projects. More information you can easily find on our website, forsorgendeswirtschaften.de. Already in the 1992, yeah, in 1992 working group, we developed three principles of a sustainable and caring economy which are contrary to the dominant principles of the economic system, then, former times, and up until today. And these caring principles are, first, cooperation, which should have priority over competition. Second, prevention, which should have priority over aftercare. And third, orientation to the necessities of life, or to what is necessary for the good life, as we said later. And this orientation should have priority over the orientation to monetary values. It is important to understand that these three principles are not new at all, but care and provisioning work, housework in households and communities has always been based on them. Therefore, the focus is not on the introduction of these caring principles, but on making them visible and reinforcing them. In our 1997 paper, Making the Hidden Visible, the importance of caring activities and their principles for any economy, Maren Jochensen and I wrote, a whole economy organized according to the principles of caring activities would be a caring economy. It would be sustainable, not only in the way it deals with material resources, but also in the way it takes into account social needs. Any economy which does not observe the above mentioned caring principles cannot be sustainable in either way. A caring economy works with the hypothesis that the principles derived from caring activities can be applied to the whole economy, thereby affecting a sustainable treatment of nature and a good society." End of quote. In the 30 years of the existence of the network, its members have developed a plurality of concepts and approaches to caring economy. Three of them will be presented later. The reproductivity theory by Adelheid Wiesecker, the importance of dependency for theory of care by Maren Jochensen, and the critical feminist ethics approach to a sustainable and caring economy by myself. But here I stop already for the moment and give the floor, perhaps back to Corinna or perhaps directly to Andreas Novi, not quite sure. Thanks a lot, Ulrike, for introducing us to um, the Netzwerk for Sorgendes Wirtschaften. I would then invite um, Andreas Novi, who is a professor at the Vienna University of Economics and Business, president of the International Kalpulani Society, and member of the Foundational Economy Collective to briefly introduce to our audience what the Foundational Economy Collective is. I would hand over to you, Andreas, and also share your slides. Um, thank you, Corina, uh, and thank you for the invitation and the opportunity for this dialogue, which I consider very important. And uh, my task in this first round is uh, to describe shortly uh, the foundational economy, how it emerged and the, the scholars working on this. And I think it's important to contextualize this uh, in the sense of that it emerged in the UK in, <clears throat> in some 10 years ago in a specific conjuncture in, in the uh, critical appraisal of neoliberal policies uh, on uh, important sectors of the welfare state. 
That was the, the key starting point and the scholars dedicated to this criticism of neoliberalism, many of them have the, a critical business background and that's probably, uh, or I assume, a difference to, uh, uh, to the network that Ulrike just described, uh, but probably also potential for uh, uh, mutual enrichment. And the key idea and the, the starting point was that neoliberalism is not only morally, morally um, deficient and has to be criticized from uh, standpoints of justice and, uh, and equality, but that it was also that is also a very bad business for uh, for the public, uh, as it is uh, subsidizing shareholders while the quality of services declines. That was the starting point, and uh, out of this concrete uh, practical interest uh, and and research on demonstrating the the failure of neoliberalism. Uh, emerged an interest uh, of conceptualizing this and the foundational economy uh, was somehow uh, one, one, the way forward to, to uh, better understand why neoliberalism is so detrimental. And the key idea behind the foundational approach is uh, that the, there exist uh, different economic zones um, which function according to different principles. And that's the, a main failure of neoliberalism, uh, a main failure relevant for the topics we are discussing. <laughs> there are several failures, uh, but a main failure is that it assumes that uh, all sectors of the economy have to be treated according to the same logic. And that's mainly a logic of capital, of money, of, uh, uh, of markets. And the criticism is that that's wrong. Huh? And here the foundational economy collective strongly <clears throat> uh, argued according to Fernand Baudel, an economic historian uh, uh, who showed that there are different zones with different logics. And one of these zones uh, is, uh, is the foundational economy and mainly differentiating it from the tradable sector. That's uh, that's uh, the foundational economy collective. There emerged uh, several series, practical works, and there was always and is always a very practical interest in, in searching for alternatives, strongly and mainly in the care sector, in the food sector, but, uh, uh, but also based on different conferences. And we have now uh, from tomorrow onwards the sixth conference of the collective. If you can switch to the second slide again, uh, Corinna. Uh, theoretically, yeah, uh, this uh, collective uh, and uh, has developed and is developing. And the sixth conference is very clearly the outcome and also a little bit the, the the, the influence of uh, of the Austrian members yeah, that uh, there is a self-critical appraisal and that's not only uh, the, the Viennese and Austrian members who agree that uh, the foundational economy and the original approach has to be enriched by feminist and, uh, and ecological concerns. Uh, and that's the way, uh, that's that's the activities we currently pursue. And that's the key concern of the, the conference tomorrow and on Friday, uh, because uh, there is a certain focus or at the beginning, there was uh, a neglect of unpaid work. Yeah? That has, that's not part of uh, the original understanding of foundational, which definitively and everybody agrees is deficient. Uh, 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 and, uh, and there has been a lack of reflection on the implications of, uh, of the ecology uh, and, uh, and environmental limits uh, on a, uh, a program of strengthening the foundation economy. Uh, yeah, but for the time being, I think for describing the collective, that's uh, sufficient. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Andreas, also to you. Um, so before we now start with the first question, let me briefly introduce the rest of the panel to the audience. So we have Maren Jochemsen, 
who is a managing director of the Essen um, College of um, Gender Research and a founding member as well as the treasurer of the network Caring Economy. We also have Adelheid Biesecker, a professor emeritus at the University of Bremen, a longstanding member and also former chairwoman of the network Caring Economy. Anna Sabe, who is a postdoctoral researcher in political economy at the Biomaterialities Research Group at the Humboldt University Berlin and part of the organizing committee for the 31st network meeting of the Netzwerk Vorsorgen des Wirtschaften, which we will host here in Vienna. And finally, Richard Berntaler, who is a researcher at the Vienna University of Economics and Business, who is also part of the organizing committee for the sixth foundational economy conference, which starts tomorrow. Thanks a lot to all six of you for being here with us today. And um, to get us started, I would like to know from each of you, what is your relation to the network caring economy for um, Maren, Ulrika, Adelheid and Anna, and in your case, Andreas and Richard, what is your um, relation to the Foundational Economy Collective and what are your main research interests related to it? I would first like to hand over to Adelheid. Um, yeah, so Adelheid, what's your um, relation and what are your main interests within the network caring economy? You are still muted. Just a second. I think you have to unmute yourself. Hmm. Um, I think it's on and yeah, now it works. It yeah. works? Okay. Yeah, perfect. You can listen. Okay. Yes, I thought about uh, your question and I found beside the friendship to a lot of you, uh, I found four main reasons why I'm a member of the network. The first one is the concept of the economy. The economy is not only the market economy, but uh, also the non-market economy. And uh, the most activities are outside the market. And that's not new, that's um, a knowledge based on the feminist uh, discussion since years and years, but it entails a critique. It makes clear that the structure of our capitalist system is a structure of externalization and that uh, the main productivities, the basic productivities are externalized. That's the productivity of unpaid labor in the middle care world and of nature. My second reason is the changement of the perspective in the network. We do not look from the market to this until now externalized, but we look from care work and from nature to the market. And our question is not what can they do for the market? Our question is, what can the market do for them, for their sustainability? I could also say which infrastructure helps to sustain the caring activities in nature. My third reason is, or there are the three action principles Ulrike already mentioned, because they are entirely different to the principles I had to teach about. I had to teach microeconomics for some of you, uh, and uh, at the core of neoclassical theory and Homo economicus is walking through the whole economy. But I think, let me uh, quote a little bit similar to Marx, he belongs to the heap of the rubbish of the history. And we develop, uh, we develop a new concept of uh, economic action, economic activities of women and men. And my fourth uh, reason is, that all these knowledge makes clear that every activity and every economic theoretical category is gendered, I would say. It's a colleague of, uh, of us has, uh, has said, uh, gender is etched in 
in all categories and the activities. And this means if we want to develop a theory for future, for sustainable economy, we have to develop new categories. Uh, the feminist debate has already developed a, a lot of ideas concerning the changement of labor. And my colleague Sabine Hofmeister, also a member uh, of this network and I, we started to develop a new theory of productivity. We call it reproductivity, the re in brackets, making clear that the, uh, the externalization of reproductive, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> <clears throat> the differentiation is between productivity and reproductivity <clears throat> is only um, a thing in the capitalist system, but it's not a, a thing for a sustainable system. It's also uh, only done by valuation because also the capitalist production processes need everyday nature and caring activities, but they don't give them a value. So we started to make clear that a sustainable societal uh, product production or reproduction process, you could say all is reproductivity or the all is productivity, uh, starts with the production of nature. And with the resources nature produces, then we can, we human beings can start our production. And the third phase is what we call consumption. But we all know that in this sphere, a lot of production takes place, but it's not uh, seen as an economic activity in the old mainstream economic theory. And then we came to the fourth phase, that's the reduction uh, uh, of nature. Nature has to take the rest of our productivity um, system and to produce new resources. We have a sort of uh, a feedback loop to make clear that the waste of today is the basis for the resources for tomorrow, also for the resources of future generations. So if we want to develop such a sustainable productive system, we have to cooperate between humans and nature. And we have to cooperate, especially concerning four dimensions. We have to cooperate concerning the quantity, how much can we take from, uh, from nature, to the quality, what can we take from nature without damaging nature. The time, in which time is nature capable of producing new resources for us or based on our waste? And then the realm, in which realm can nature work for a good, good resource production? And let me finish, if we are uh, intelligent enough to find such good cooperative principles, then we don't speak about natural, uh, the, the, oh, Boundaries. Uh, Pardon? Boundaries. Or sorry, boundaries. sorry. I just uh, forgot. Uh, this. We don't speak about natural boundaries. They are boundaries against the capitalistic um, um, growth, yes. But now we speak about natural wealth. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Adelheid, for this input. I would next hand back over to Ulrike to tell us about, we heard a bit about your relation to the network, but also what are your specific um, research interests within the frame of the network, Ulrike? Yes, I will do so, of course. Um, the, the research work I have brought into the network caring economy and uh, in this early conference working group um, is the research on an as uh, often economic ethicist, um, integrating gender, economics, and ethics. In 1992, I was very much, it was the beginning, uh, this working group on this uh, ecological economics conference. Um, in this time, I was very much involved into an ethics from a feminist perspective. An ethics, including women's everyday life, Mm -hmm. Sandra Harding's idea of starting from women's lives, thinking, 
starting from women's side, was extremely helpful. Of course, today we need to include other intersectional categories like class, race, age, and many more. But to understand that the ethics of Aristotle and Kant and all of them is not universal enough mm. if the women's world is excluded was a milestone to me. Mm -hmm. Since then, I always question the normative foundation of theories, concepts and argumentations, which are still far too often androcentric, patriarchal, not generalizable, not universal enough, and neither caring nor sustainable. I went through all the ethical concepts from Aristotle to Kant and asked myself, if we have to discard them, throw them away. The short answer is no, <laughs> followed by a long but. I will not go into deeper here. Carol Gilligan's book In a Different Voice from 1982 and her Ethics of Care was a turning point from which I could restart in these days. Mm. And I did in earlier publications. In this time, Maren was working on her PhD, Maren Jochensen was working on her PhD on ecological economics. And her ecological and my ethical perspectives we brought together in our paper, already mentioned um, on earlier conference paper that we presented 1993 on the out of the margin conference in Amsterdam and revised for this other publication in 1997. Um, exactly. In integrating ecology and ethics into economics, we developed, the, we developed the concept of a caring economy using the caring principles I already have mentioned. And we developed the ICE model. Uh, the I is for an industrial economic thought and action, and the E for ecological processes, and the C for caring activities. And this ICE model says simply, the economic system, the industrial economic and the capitalist economic system is based on caring activities and ecological processes. And as an economic ethicist, I make the important addition that this economic system is based on caring activities and ecological processes without valuing these foundations but constantly exploiting them, the ecological processes mm -hmm. as well as caring activities. In the early 1990s, caring economy was a totally new concept. Only the term ethics of care already existed, was created um, in the Times and perhaps uh, really through Carol Gilligan. Approaches to care economics have been developed only later and they focus usually on care for the young, sick and old and not on ecological topics. Mm -hmm. So what are my main research topics concerning this early concept of caring economy in, the rela in relation to the network, network for Sorgeneswirtschaften? After quite a long while uh, being into uh, care, care work, um, care economy, um, or care economics, I would like to bring together care, gender, and ecology uh, nature again. And we have this working meeting end of October. Uh, some of you know about this. Um, the other topic is uh, rethinking um, the sustainable and caring principles and developing criteria to start a monitoring process, to really have some criteria to say in which direction we are moving, back or forth or constant. And the, the, here for the moment, the last one is uh, networking social ecological networks. Um, that was a paper for an international conference 2021, which I did again with Maren Jochensen and Anne Christine Kleinert. She's also here in the audience, I saw, um, and a poster and a publication. So networking social ecological networks uh, to, not, uh, to not always reinventing the wheel over and over again, but building on what, on what already exists and bring it together. Because 
none alone can succeed in designing and shaping a sustainable and caring future. We have to network and bring all the good ideas together. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ulrika. I'm really happy that we have this forum here to really bring two networks together today. Maren, I would next hand over to you and ask us to tell, ask you to tell us more about your research interest within the network. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as was mentioned before, I am one of the founders of the network Caring Economy or Netzwerk Vorsorgen des Wirtschaften. And over the time, I became interested in caring activities. This has to do with the um, German term, which is Vorsorge, entailing the term Sorge, care, and has been translated, for example, for the second action principles into the um, principle of precaution or prevention, which is all aspects of it, but doesn't really um, um, fill the term, uh, grasp the notion it has in the German language. So um, very early on, the, we had a group working on theoretical issues and uh, it said that the action principle uh, of Vorsorge always refers to the complex caring relationship itself. Um, so now what is this complex caring relationship? And in a way I'm uh, kind of in between, I'm also re referring to what uh, Andrea said in his overview. So what I'm going to say now is in between what was mentioned there as the core economy and was mentioned as the foundational economy because um, the situation uh, which I grasped in my publication, Careful Economics, Integrating Caring Activities and Economic Science, aims to develop a pre-institutional concept of caring. So irrespective of whether this activity is paid or not. So it's in the unpaid realm, but it's also in, it could be grasped in health, for example, um, in, in your overview. So when I came to have a closer look at caring, I figured out that there are three interdependent preconditions of a situation that I labeled dependency situation because I wanted to conceptually grasp a caring situation um, as very different from exchange situation. So I came to the care for people who are existentially dependent on caring services. So children, the very sick, the elderly, all of us when we have to go to hospital. So it can happen to any of us every day. It's, it's nothing very specific. And I uh, said that there are three interdependent pre preconditions to this concept. One is the limited or complete lack of capacity to act on the uh, part of the care recipient. Um, the second is asymmetrical starting positions of the person involved with the regard to the ability to carry out the required care service and possibly also to access the involved resources. I will explain in a minute what is meant by this. And uh, third, the resultant actual and possible dependencies and power relations involved. So very clearly, one can see that it's about assumptions of relatedness it's about assumptions of asymmetry, it's about assumptions of dependency and assumptions about inherent power structures. Now, um, the, my concept of a caring situation says, well, we have a caregiver and a care receiver between the two of them. And I focus on person-to-person -person activities for the time being, a caring activity is performed. Um, this is makes up the caring relationship. And then we have, I call it the provider, uh, not to be confused with the care provider, but the provider or the resources. I will also explain that later on. So making uh, the situation have three components, a work component, and I call it work component, that is the caring activity performed by the caregiver to the care receiver, who by assumption cannot perform this activity himself or herself. Um, a resource component, time, place, materials, finances, that a current situation that can, needs to come to uh, support the caring relationship, um, and a motivation component. Now, why is the motivation component important? Because um, a current situation 
is a complex system of one-way transfers. Uh, part of the assumption of the limited um, ability to act by the care receiver is also to assume that there will be no return to the service. And I'm not talking about immaterial returns uh, and immaterial rewards in this situation. I'm not questioning this, but for the sake of uh, the conceptualization, I assume that there's none because I'm interested in how we perform uh, economic activities without an immediate return. So the, care, the caring activity to the care receiver is a one-way transfer. And then um, if you think of a small child, the small child itself also doesn't have access to resources. So the resources can either be managed and provided by the caregiver, or they come, uh, by, come from the care receiver. If you think of an elderly person who gives his or her pension to finance the caring service, or they can come from without at all. So, um, it's a complex system of one-way transfer and our the task of the social and economic organization of the caring activities is now to bring together these three components in a way as to minimize um, additional asymmetries, to minimize additional dependencies, uh, and that's quite a task. So um, that's the basic construct, and then you can add uh, paid or unpaid to it. Um, but uh, it's also clear, and I, maybe I can also briefly mention this, there's also fields of tensions. And I, I marked out uh, three different fields of tensions. One is uh, if you take the motivation component versus economization. Um, there is a discussion about if you economize uh, caring um, activities, uh, you over-economize the caring um, sector that might crowd out um, motivation. Mm -hmm. um, There's a big discussion there, a lot uh, can be said of it. Uh, another is um, uh, freedom of choice on the part of the caregiver and the fair expectation of the care receiver to be cared for. So kind of uh, a right to good care in society, how, how to combine this. So these are two of uh, the tension lines. And there's the third, which slipped my, um, the third is, yeah, the so-called, um, the caring motivation versus um, self-sacrifice and exploitation. That is the free riding of the rest of the economy and society on the caring motivations of dedicated caregivers. We also have to find a solution to that. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Maren, for zooming in really on, on caring activities for us. Um, I would last but not least for the network caring economy hand over to Anna Sabe and ask her what are your relations and your research interests within the network caring economy, Anna. Yeah, sure. So um, Adelheid started off this uh, round of the, the four people from the network with saying that what she values most in a network is friendship. And that is kind of the same for me, but of course it's also mentorship thinking about this conference that Ulrike mentioned from 1993, Out of the Margins, I was three years old. So <laughs> of course, this is about mentorship. And it's so important because this is one of the, the spaces in the German speaking um, academic realm where we can really learn about the economy through the lens of relations. Mm -hmm. Relations like externalization, what Adelaide mentioned, like exploitation, what um, Ulrike mentioned, and relations like caring relations that might be considered part of the official economy or might not. So this is really super helpful. And also um, it is a space where you can really learn the tools that you need to learn when you want to teach things like feminist economics. So this really is cannot be underestimated the importance for the whole um, mm -hmm. debate uh, around feminist economics that this network really had in the previous decades. So my name is Anna Save. I'm a political economist and 
I work mainly about um, society nature metabolisms and their economic mediation and especially about accumulation theories. And this is something that also has been taken up in, in the network, but um, yeah, it has been taken up um, in many other places as well. And so as one of the persons from the younger generation that also includes Corinna and also other people that are present here in the audience, it is kind of my role to um, be a connector also to other debates, mm -hmm. international debates like um, around degrowth. This is a much younger debate and it really builds on what has been done in the network caring economy. And what we especially want to connect is the feminisms and degrowth debate and the network caring economy. So feminisms and degrowth, this is a loose collective, an international one that really spans um, practitioners and academics all, uh, all around the world. And um, actually a focal point of all the debate in feminisms and degrowth is actually the three principles that Adelheid mentioned in the beginning. Mm -hmm. No, that Ulrike mentioned in the beginning. Um, it is, maybe people use other words, but this is really what brings us together. And it is not trivial to emphasize those principles. It is actually important work because the degrowth movement or the degrowth debate is um, scattered. It includes many different strands. And so making sure that feminist perspectives are present mm -hmm. is our work. And it means resisting the subalternization of social reproduction. And it's also an even more work to ensure that queer and decolonial perspectives are present there. So this is a project, an international, but also a, an, for the economics discipline, a project of unlearning and disrupting conventional politics of knowing and action. This is what we're trying to do both in the network caring economy and in the feminisms and of debates. So, um, one aspect that maybe hasn't been mentioned so far is that um, what's important for growing economies is not only that the official economy grows, but also um, how the people in those economies are actually thinking about themselves and how they're acting. So femininities and masculinities are super important for, the, for any economy and changing accumulation regimes, for example, from the current paradigm of a growing economy to a caring economy to a foundational economy really means a change in femininities and masculinities. And maybe bridging this a bit to um, the foundational economy, we could ask, like, how um, does a state that follows a foundational, foundational economy, how does it regulate sexuality or reproduction? Mm -hmm. Or how does a state that sus uh, subscribes to degrowth, how does this regulate sexuality and reproduction. So these are really complex questions, but if we don't um, take them into account, then really a big part of what living is and what societies are beyond the um, tra more traditional measures of um, what the economy means, that are, these are really left out and we need to take them into account. And this is also where we have those connection points to decolonial um, thought and to queer queering practices. And maybe to end on uh, on another personal note, why I'm a part of this network is also because it is a source of hope. So mm -hmm. yes. to <laughs> yeah, to care is is more than to survive, and that's so important, especially in the summer and possibly in all those summers to come. So caring and putting care at the heart of economies really does bring change to democracies. Because when people start to reclaim that they want to care and that they want to be able to be cared for, this must change the economy. And for the Wirtschaft network caring, um, network caring economy and also other um, more diverse um, ecological feminisms, they really show that we need to reclaim not only to care, but only reclaim to be reproductive and especially that contributing to reproductivity comes easy, that it's actually the default. Mm -hmm. And um, it's that it comes easier than producing even more social and ecological external cost. And this shift in perspective and this qualitative difference 
that is really at the center of the debates that we have in the network caring economy and also in the feminisms and degrowth alliance. This is what brings me hope. Thanks a lot, Anna, and to you and to all the speakers who now gave their diverse perspectives on the network um, caring economy. I especially like the hope and the unlearning and disrupting and would now hand over to um, Andreas and then afterwards to Richard to talk about their relation um, to the Foundational Economy Collective and and your main research interest related to it. Andrea, Andrea, I'll hand the word to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the contributions so far. And, and there, there are indeed uh, uh, several overlaps. Uh, and, uh, and I will start. I have always been very much interested in spatial questions and context. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's uh, uh, one of the characteristics of the foundational economy, which has a very strong Welsh background uh, uh, and uh, to understand it uh, and and they aim at interfering in 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 practice and and politics in in Wales and a little bit that's the same what we aim in in Austria when we founded the international Karl Polanyi society it was a Viennese uh, journalist I mean Turnheyer who wrote once in 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 a periodical uh, that there is an Austrian school of economics, uh, uh, Hayek, Mises, etc., which uh, which brought uh, so much harm to the world and and suffering, and it would be uh, very much appreciated if another um, Austrian Viennese tradition, the one of Karl Polanyi, would be given much more voice in 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 Austrian academia, and indeed that's what we are aiming at, and and that inspired our. Uh, uh, our society and the activities we are undertaking and also the, the objective to present a different vision of how to uh, speak about the economy, how to look at the economy. And uh, as it's in, in our mission statement of the uh, Polani society to put the economy in its place. Mm -hmm. uh, and this contextualization, uh, Maren, when you uh, refer to Sorge, yeah, and 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 uh, and the translational issues related to this, indeed, I think uh, uh, language uh, is an important component of uh, of context, uh, and uh, the the strong dominance of the English language has its disadvantages, and especially with the topics that we are dealing with. Because Sorge, and that's what I learned from from Corina Deng, uh, Corina Deng, uh, from, uh, from Cornelia Klinger, uh, uh, is uh, that Sorge is such a rich German word. Huh? And mm -hmm. interestingly, for you from the uh, from the caring economy background, uh, we decided. Uh, to simplify in, in German language, uh, we, we argue that the foundational economy can be summarized as Daseinsvorsorge and mm -hmm. Nahversorgung. Uh, and, uh, and interestingly, uh, both of these words have Sorge in there uh, uh, in, as part of the, the word. And that's, I think, uh, Sorgsam and all other uh, related uh, uh, words yeah, they they are very important for the intentions that we have in 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 fostering caring and uh, a caring and a foundational economy mm -hmm. and out of this um <clears throat> and in continuation uh what kind of inspires me and what i'm working on uh and that's also i think that Come strongly from ecological and feminist economics and uh, and converges is this concern and interest in uh, in provisioning, you know? mm -hmm. uh, which also has uh, a Polanian uh, uh, relationship with the four forms of provisioning, integration, or uh, however you want to call it, householding, reciprocity, mm -hmm. uh, redistribution, and, uh, and market exchange, uh, mm -hmm. which hint to this uh, plurality of, of institutional logics uh, and, uh, uh, and the 
plurality of a, of a mixed economy. Mm -hmm. And my uh, ambition uh, is to contribute to a, uh, to a different language on uh, uh, talking about uh, organizing the livelihood, talking about the economy, which is based on provisioning as, the, as a key concept, uh, uh, different to the market. Uh, and as we are, uh, and that's Corinna, Richard, and myself uh, uh, at, at uh, a University of Economics and Business, uh, it's it's impressive with all the evidence that you presented uh, and the decade long uh, research and convincing arguments how uh, unshattered uh, uh, the, the market uh, uh, ideology uh, uh, still is in uh, in much of business and economics. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, as I entered into uh, climate research over the last years, it was probably the the the, the worst uh, learning uh, to mm -hmm. see how strongly climate research is influenced by this uh, economic uh, approach centered on the market uh, and how decisive it would be uh, to contribute to a shift on uh, uh, un understanding something so uh, decisively society nature relationship mm -hmm. to take mm -hmm. a, a term from Anna yeah, uh, mm -hmm. to to conceptualize this uh, with with provisioning instead of uh, market externalities internalizing market failure uh, uh, co-benefits and and all these economistic terms mm -hmm. and I think one of the advantages that we have is uh, and that's the way also you presented it in the uh, in your different uh, short personal histories is that the language to talk about the economy is more beautiful. Yeah? It, it, it's more uh, next to uh, common sense and, and, and understanding also of ordinary people. And I think this is a strength we must not underestimate. Uh, a danger or, or a, uh, a potential shortcoming is uh, to neglect uh, uh, focusing on the rest of the economy, on the tradable sector and the capitalist economy, as it has such a strong impact. And that's mm. when I describe the origins of the foundational economy, a strong and detrimental impact on the foundational and caring sectors of the economy that we have to deal with them and uh, to look for strategies, uh, as we call it in climate research, of exnovation, yeah? mm -hmm. how we can end certain activities in the tradable sector and also detrimental activities in the foundational sector, like car dependency, for example. So I think the, the interest for macrostructures is definitely an important component of, of such a caring foundational uh, economic approach. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I think that's it is a promising way forward. And that's why I'm so happy to have mm -hmm. this discussion here. Thanks a lot, Andreas. I would now hand over to Richard to present your um, relations to foundational economy. Yeah, thank you also very much, Corinna, for, for inviting me. Um, so I've been working on the foundational economy together with Andreas, Leonard Planck, and, and many others for some years now, and have, I think, mainly focused on three issues. Um, the first is the attempt to further specify the diverging logics of economic zones, which is basically what, what Andreas um, presented and is closely related to this whole idea of uh, economics as the science of social ecological provisioning. And in this context, we're also currently um, co-editing a special issue on provisioning systems in a social ecological transformation. Um, my second, second um, focus was the attempt or is the attempt to embed foundational thinking more thoroughly into a biophysical reality mm. that is characterized by ecological crisis. Mm. And this is also a topic that I will focus specifically during the conference in the next two days, particularly trying to bring together foundational economy um, research with the idea of corridors, um, production consumption corridors and uh, safe and just space basically. 
And the third focus is yeah, the attempt to emphasize that unpaid care work is an essential element of our shared foundations and must therefore not be neglected in um, foundation economic research. And especially against the, the background of this third aspiration, I would maybe like to end this round of introductory statement thereby start our conversation by highlighting what I think is the most um, yeah, fundamental commonality between the caring economy and the foundational, uh, foundation economy networks. And even though this might be obvious for many joining this webinar, I nevertheless think um, it's important to make this explicit from the start. Why? Because it is also where our yeah, very thinking and thinking process um, starts. And this is the question, what does it mean to be a human being? Or in other words, what constitutes our human condition in which our potential to flourish um, is grounded? And there have, of course, been different answers to this question in the history of ideas. For example, liberal political theory um, has placed the independent individual at the center of our human condition. If you follow you know, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, human beings are in the state of nature, free and independent individuals. And this theory suggests that at some point we decided to enter social contract, we submitted to, a rule of, to the rule of a state and thereby gave up part of our individual independence that is said to be a core feature of our natural human condition. Mm -hmm. And Hobbes and Locke, of course, different arguments why we entered this, this contract according to Hobbes, because otherwise we would all just kill each other. According to Locke, we did that because it's the smart thing to do as a rational individual. Mm -hmm. But both share a conception of human beings as by nature self-governing and independent individuals. And this understanding actually characterizes Western thinking until today, um, be it in the methodological individualism of neoclassical economics, mm -hmm. or also um, very much in the appeal to individual responsibility, for example, in fighting the climate crisis, in responding to a pandemic, or in the context of what is known as responsabilization, for example, via you know, private pension funds, private health insurance, and so on. But in context to this conception, the Republican and, and feminist political theories actually turn this liberal argument on its head and argue that human beings have always existed only in relationship with others mm -hmm. and with nature. So human beings are social, political, and biophysical beings. That is, they're part of families, circles of friends, household, communities, societies, and so on. And they're living beings. That means they're part of nature. Mm -hmm. The human condition in this conception is then one of relationality, vulnerability, and mutual interdependence, not independence. We depend on others and on the environment or on a certain environment that allows human flourishing. Yeah. And as such, um, human beings, and really like the definition by, by Martin Nussbaum on that, um, are conceptualized as needy and mature beings. And I think this is a really, really nice um, definition. Mm -hmm. um, and likewise, Simon Critchley, for example, drawing on, on the work of Emmanuel Levinas, even argues that describing human beings as individuals is a category mistake, basically, as we're not indivisible, but essentially individuals, meaning that the other is always part of oneself, since we're always dependent on known and unknown others. Mm -hmm. Crucially, this implies that the precarity of one's own life always begins with the precarity of the other, for example, of the paid or unpaid essential workers on which our lives depend. Mm -hmm. And as vulnerability and interdependence are, of course, to varying degrees, um, universal, unavoidable, and permanent aspects of human beings, independence, autonomy, and self-realization are cultural achievements that always presuppose and require collective systems of social reproduction. Mm -hmm. The development of a child requires the care of its parents or of carer. The success of an entrepreneur requires public systems and households that reproduce healthy and educated workers. And any form of autonomy requires livable environments. So strictly speaking, there is no such thing as a self-made man or self-made woman. Elon Musk and others are anything but self-made. And against this background, I think that both the caring economy and the foundational economy networks aim at bringing to focus, valorizing, and prioritizing those collective conditions of social reproduction on which everyday life and human flourishing depends, from unpaid care work to our public infrastructures. And as such, both networks problematize the fact that our un- and decommodified infrastructures of social reproduction are under constant attack by pressures of commodification, mm -hmm. which, to quote David Harvey, makes exchange value the master and use value the slave, or in other words, submits the logic of life making to that of profit making, even though, of course, the latter depends on the former. 
So to sum up by, I think, bringing to focus, valorizing and prioritizing our collective conditions, the caring economy and the foundational economy explicitly counteract the appeal to individual responsibility to tackle collective challenges. Mm -hmm. The care crisis, the climate crisis, the cost of living crisis, the housing crisis, you name it. So in the language of the latest APCC special report on climate friendly living, which has just been published, the focus is therefore not so much on individual behavior, Verhalten, but on the shaping, Gestalten of our collective provisioning systems. Mm. And if I'm not mistaken, I think this is a crucial commonality of our networks that we could pursue also further. Yeah, thanks a lot, Richard, for already pointing out some of the commonalities. And thanks everyone for this great input on and really um, diverse views on the two networks. So I would like to grant us some minutes in case any of the speakers had, has immediate reactions on some things that another panelist raised. So is there something that sparked your mind that you would like to add here and now um, before we start into a round of questions? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, being an economist and being interested in uh, theory, uh, you uh, listened to my speech. I ask, uh, what is your concept of the future economy? Uh, which do, uh, do you have also special principles? Uh, the last one, I don't know, you, I don't have your name. You spoke about individuality and uh, collectiveness. And I think in the feminist uh, speech, it's clear that we all are individuals in a group. Or as Sioni said, the eyes need a we to be, and we, we, need, we need also nature to be. Uh, that's clear. But, uh, what what uh, are you doing with the economy? If you say um, in the German title of your book, the Ökonomie des Alltagsleben, the e economics of all day life, um, uh, how do you think about the future? Do you think that this all uh, all day life uh, is still uh, a counterpart to the market? And what are you doing with the capitalist markets and so on? I know uh, there are big questions and uh, I only know uh, very small things from you. I had uh, a look to your website and today I read in the internet some pages of this book uh, to, uh, to have an impression. And I'm very interested in your ideas of infrastructure. What is a sustainable infrastructure? Very, very important. So I have a lot of questions and I would uh, like to discuss hours and hours and hours. <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot, Adelheid. That's really big questions. I don't know who of you, Andreas or Richard, would maybe like to start responding to something of this. Um, Max. Yeah, I can try to start with some, some ideas. I mean, I think in, in, in the context of the foundation economy, the future economy is certainly some form of mixed economy, um, where, however, um, the dominance of markets um, has decreased in a way. And this is the whole idea that um, what we also try to bring in that the point is not only to strengthen the foundational economy, but also to shrink other economic zones. And this is this is important, especially when you think about um, uh, rent extraction. Um, Andreas showed that in his table, where we have a certain economic zone, which is not really a zone, but it, it is above other economic zones that always tries to extract value from other activities. And I think it's a first transition step towards a future economy must be to tackle rent extraction and the extractive nature of, of certain economic activities. So this would be for me the, the first important step towards a future economy that also allows for, for a better mix of, of um, economic zones. Do you want to add something, Andreas? Um, if not, Anna is also raising her hand to ask maybe another question or also respond to it. Anna? Go ahead. Go ahead, Anna. All right. Well, it might be um, something that um, Andreas also wants to react to later. 
Um, so I hope I don't um, take us too much uh, away from that. So first of all, a reaction to um, what Richard just said. Thank you for clarifying this kind of future vision. Well, coming from my analysis and also probably um, a lot of the analysis shared in the network, shrinking some economic zones that are maybe oriented more towards exchange values um, rather than use values totally makes the most sense. But it might be um, a drop of water on the hot stone. Um, if you do not, or this saying does not translate to English, but if you do not get rid of the logics of externalization, the shrinking alone um, might help a bit, but it will not cure the problem. And so um, taking this root problem of um, the accumulation of capital depends on externalization and appropriation. How do we get rid of those logics rather than shrinking the sectors where this is very present? I think this is something that it will possibly be a reaction from many people um, I expect from the network, but it doesn't, um, yeah, it doesn't um, mean that I cannot follow you the logic that you just presented and it makes sense possibly as a first step. So the network has thought a lot about um, Zwischenräume, so spaces in between or um, intermediate steps um, of transformation. And this might be um, something that ties into, into this strategy. And this is also now related to the question that I actually meant to ask. So what is really interesting from, um, from my perspective of the network carrying economy, looking at the foundation economy, is that you mentioned, um, well, we have this new um, perspective on, on the whole of the economy now. Let's really apply this to our metabolism very concretely. And then you spoke about corridors and you spoke about something else as well. And that's really interesting, I think on a strategic level because you make it so concrete. And a critique that was um, kind of often voiced towards the network carrying economy is that the steps towards change are not as concrete as what you just mentioned. So this is some sort of self critique that I think the network is still dealing with. But also there is a strategic difference because um, the process of coming to a caring economy was all, also intentionally left open to allow for democratic discourse, democratic change and so on. So the network caring economy decided more um, to formulate logics for this transformation rather than prescribing concrete steps for this transformation. Now we are at the conundrum that we don't have time we actually are past that point that we actually have time. So we need to speed up everything. And this is, I think, where the, where the practical uh, strategy of corridors and making it more concrete really comes in. And this is something that the network carrying economy has to look at if we take seriously the state of the world. So I think this is a really, really nice um, opportunity to learn from each other. Thank you, Anna. Does someone want to respond to this directly or should we keep the, should we keep um, the ideas that Anna put out there for the next round of questions where I'm gonna ask you something and then maybe you Andreas or you Richard um, integrate it into your answer. Okay. So great, I think um, from what I have heard from all your interventions, there are really a lot of similarities between the two networks. So both share this general outlook and also the normative vision of the good life and good care for all within planetary boundaries. And so um, three principles, the network caring economy has formulated, it has been mentioned sometimes, so care, cooperation, and taking the essentials of a good life as a guideline, they resemble the foundational economy thinking quite a lot. But what I would be interested in is if any of you see some differences or maybe also fruitful tensions to, to pose it in a positive way between the two networks. And more concretely, maybe I would like to start with either Maren or Rike. Um, I, I'm interested in what in the beginning Andreas has described as the core economy of family and community. Um, so that's 
So, so in the different zones that he described, so there's a foundational economy and then there's a core economy of family and community, which is exemplified by parenting um, and which in foundational economy thinking is conceptualized as basically non-economic. And I would be really interested, do you think this resembles or in some ways also maybe contradicts um, the thinking in the network caring economy? Ulrike? Yeah, um, I start with the, with the core economy um, and family and community as, as non-economic um, because I think this is um, some kind of contradict, uh, contradictory, um, but I have to um, admit that I'm not very familiar with foundational economic uh, economy, and so I just can try to, to or I will um, give the, the ideas of the network um, for Zonus Wirtschaften, and then we have to figure out where the contradiction is, and perhaps also in advance, um, I think contradiction are important and we have to find them and discuss and overcome perhaps or not overcome. We need all the perspectives. And I think one of the, the differences um, between um, uh, uh, um, what is it again, Fem foundational economy uh, and caring economy is that uh, the um, perspectives are totally different. Um, here, it, uh, the, the subtitle of the book is Neue Infrastrukturpolitik, and uh, the focus is there. And um, it's only part of a caring economy, of course. It's not the whole. And uh, I said already that Adelheid uh, comes from the reproductive theory and Maren from care theory and myself from ethics. And so we need all these approaches and views and perspectives to really find out how we can survive on this planet. That's the question. And perhaps it's... Uh, yeah, it takes too long for the answer, but we, we of course, have to uh, go into it. Um, what I want to answer to this question is family and uh, community non-economic. Yes. No, it is uh, the, uh, the source of economy. We have households um, and uh, house. Um, the, the economy itself comes from oikos and nomos, and it says it's uh, um, uh, the, the economy of the household, um, the doing and the activities of the household. That's the source of our economic thinking. And so I think we need more critical household theory. How does a household um, behave uh, provision well, what is done there and i think leaving out these household economy not like home economics that's uh, or new home economics that's uh, only uh, neoclassical economics for the household but really going into this um, 2000 year to, uh, since the uh, uh, neolithic uh, revolution we have households um, in one or the other kinds they had to um, to do or uh, economize and, and do economy in a special way. And capitalist economy is very contrast to that. And of course, we have the capitalization of households and so on and so on. But what I want to say is that we have to look into the households um, to get economy right. Thanks a lot, Ulrike. I have Maren on the speakers list and then afterwards, Andreas. Maren? I'm sorry. I wondered whether it might be helpful if Andreas put on his slide um, with the different uh, realms of action, um, because I'm not quite sure I fully understand whether it's we are talking about the left column now. Uh, we are talking about the care, core, or is it care or core, the core economy? which is considered really not being part of the economy. Do I understand correctly? I don't think so, no. Yeah, but then I, I personally need some clarification, but same as Ulrika, I would say that is what we said in the ICE model, 
uh, the the uh, the maintenance economy or the um, this is the foundation of any economic activities you smash that and you can forget about the rest because nothing will function no employees will show up at work or go somewhere to be cured i mean yeah uh, but maybe if you could kindly explain um some more clearly uh, what's what's how do you see the things because i think i did not fully understand. Yeah, may, may I? I think there, there, uh, that 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 was <clears throat> that's a misunderstanding because even I mean even the most original uh, foundational economy uh, uh, concepts of the core economy, foundation economy would not dare to say that the core economy is not economy and householding is not economic. Yeah? So I think that's uh, that that would be unfair. Uh, to the uh, foundational economy, but yeah, uh, and I think in this respect, there is uh, the, the discussion is uh, not so difficult. That simply the foundational economy in in conceptualizing the relationship, what is here uh, yellow, the core, the foundational economy, should be better related to one another, and and there uh, it can learn from from. Uh, from the care economy approaches, yeah, but uh, uh, that that's really the 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 core point, yeah, uh, and uh, and I think there is uh, that that was really now a, a misunderstanding, yeah, and and the way we talk about it, yeah, uh, currently is that the core economy needs uh, specific, uh, referring to Anna, specific. Uh, short-term practical interventions, which most probably have a lot to do with time politics and infrastructure politics. So uh, a walkable city makes the core economy uh, uh, easier. Uh, 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 time politics, uh, working time reduction and, and other uh, support structures facilitate uh, the core economy. Uh, 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 reducing uh, existential risks uh, facilitates the core economy. So I think these would be uh, a foundational suggestions for dealing with the, the core economy. Yeah? Uh, and we, and now that's, that's uh, our approach, would argue that there are always boundary struggles between yeah, uh, the different uh, zones yeah, and things are shifting yeah, and uh, part of caring activities, they change from unpaid care to uh, public provision in, in the health and education system. And that uh, can be good or bad, but these are processes that one has to investigate. Yeah? And and I think here really it, it's, it could be a helpful uh, uh, mutually enriching dialogue. What I think uh, where there might be a, a difference when I listen to Anna indeed uh, uh, is with respect to, to the focus. Yeah? While uh, the, the caring economy collective uh, has a strong interest in, in, in describing uh, uh, a good economy, uh, the foundational economy collective right from the beginning. And in this sense, I think we in Vienna and Austria have a strong uh, uh, common understanding with, with the Welsh and, uh, and, 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 and other foundational thinkers that uh, we have the practical interest, what are the first, uh, the next steps in advancing in the direction towards a more caring and, and foundational economy. And in this respect, I think the idea of shrinking is a very strong uh, uh, political strategy because uh, different economic sectors always live together and have always been living together. And even if uh, we are living in a capitalist society, that was never dominant. Yeah? So uh, what is possible in the future that there might be ongoing, and I would agree with Richard, uh, an ongoing market economy with no 
rent dimensions yeah, and no rent sector. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a possibility of uh, uh, that we can, uh, can um, proceed with first steps in this direction. Yeah? And I think that's, uh, that's helpful for strategizing and for empowering political agency. And here I see really strengths of the foundational approach. Thanks a lot, Andreas. Um, I have Richard and then Maren on the speaking list. And after that, I would like to open um, the floor for the audience. Richard, you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just quickly, I also wanted to, to emphasize that I think no one in the Foundation Economy Collective conceptualizes the core economy as non-economic. It's, it's an economic zone, among others, that has certain logics, that has different logics in other zones. But of course, what we focus more on, I think, is, is what we conceptualize as the foundational economy. So what kind of labor, and Andreas and, and colleagues wrote a nice report on that, what kind of labor goes into these infrastructures, not just to build them, but to maintain and reproduce them. And they, for example, looked at the gendered labor that goes in, in different sectors of the foundational economy to reproduce this foundational economy. What, of course, we need to strengthen, and this has been mainly neglected, is that, of course, all the, the hidden housework and, and household work and what we conceptualize core economy, of course, also implicitly goes in there. And this has not been conceptualized so well. On the other hand, we also, I think, try to highlight that the core economy is not more foundation as the foundation economy, and the foundation economy is not more foundation as the core economy, but they are somehow on the same level, because also the, the household depends on certain infrastructures, as much as the infrastructures depend on unpaid work from the household. So I think we see it more in, in a relational way, rather than saying that the one is more, um, more foundational than the other, even though that in general, of course, the core economy and the foundational economy, and that we would argue, is more foundational than the rest of the economy, because it's basically responsible for social reproduction. Thanks, Richard. Maren? I have one question. We do not need to discuss it now, but for me, it would be one important question to also shed more light on what is the relation of the foundation and economy to the core economy, for example, would be, why would it be important to facilitate the core economy? Just a question. Why is this of consideration to the foundation and economy? And um, the other thing, but that's just a side mark, um, you have the non-local, non non-essential non local services. And I'm just taking an example here. I know that's just <laughs> a very random. Um, you have the hairdressers. If I cannot cut my hair myself, and I'm not, I'm just talking about cutting, and I don't have any friends to ask, and I don't have scissors, um, from what point of view then is a hairdresser non-essential? Um, that's also just an open question. It brings me to, and this is the, the thing that I think also Ulrike alluded, what is the um, ethical point of view of the foundational economy? From what values do, would the economy decide what is essential, what is not? Uh, why are the export service, are cars essential? Open questions, just for further discussions. Great, thanks a lot, Maren. Maybe those questions we can already write down now and bring them um, together in an answer round after we collect some more questions from the audience, if there are any. Um, we see we have a big panel, so it's good to be um, specific in your questions. If the question is to a specific speaker, also name that. Um, yeah, I would open now. So if you have a question, raise your hand, please. Andreas is not the audience, but meanwhile, that the audience thinks, um, I would take you, Andreas. That was the intention, if there's no question. 
I would try to answer uh, Marin's question. Uh, I think the our understanding would be a political one. Yeah, w uh, what is foundational and not, yeah? and and that would uh, emerge out of two considerations. The one is. Uh, uh, um, knowledge truth let's say truth yeah what uh, what uh, science and research tells you yeah? and that tells you that uh, cars uh, are very detrimental uh, for a good life for all yeah? and there is uh, a lot of uh, scientific evidence of this so uh, 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 knowledge would be one criteria yeah? and the second criteria would be context uh, specific uh, decision making democracy participation yeah? so uh, leaving it up to uh, uh, whether uh, and what type of, of heating and what type of uh, 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 caring for oneself is, is considered more or less uh, important uh, so these together yeah, uh, uh, bottom up uh, democratic uh, decisions and, and knowledge would make up uh, whether uh, something is in one or the other zones, knowing that there is no objective uh, uh, distinction and these distinctions change over time uh, 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 historically. Thank you. As I wrote again in the chat, the floor is open for questions from the audience. Unless I see a hand, I would now take Richard and then Adelheid. Yeah, maybe maybe to add to that, I mean, there is one, I think, normative consideration, which is, I mean, there are human needs, and human needs can be satisfied in different ways. And the normative consideration is that collective forms of provisioning are usually better than individualized forms of provisioning both in terms of need satisfaction, as well as in terms of ecological um, considerations. Um, so in term, when we come to the example of the car, a foundational approach would be to expand public transport because it, um, it allows for better need satisfaction, also for poor people who cannot afford a car, for people who, can, who cannot drive a car, and it's ecologically um, better, basically. And I think this is a general normative um, and also science-guided consideration that we aim for collective forms of provisioning rather than individualized forms of provisioning to satisfy needs. And yeah. Thanks, Adelheid. Um, you're on mute again. You have to unmute yourself in the left, left corner, left down, links unten. Yeah, now it's okay. Yeah. Don't know why it changed. Okay. It's always the same question. I, I, I would say, what is your concept of a good life? And which role plays nature? Because we uh, look from the externalized, and that's, uh, that's the nature as well as the caring activities. And uh, how, uh, if you say, Richard, I think the last one, you say um, collective. Uh, systems are better than individual ones, but if they are also um, full of capitalistic rationality, they Adel had you on mute again. I don't know how it happened, but we cannot hear you anymore. But only the last four or five words. Yeah, now. I'm back again. I don't know what it is. I had to to uh, um, renew my my Zoom. Perhaps that's something. Okay, I'm sorry. So, uh, what are the the criteria for a better system of infrastructure? Because I'm very interested in your ideas of infrastructure. Because we need for a caring, a sustainable society, uh, very different infrastructures. But what are your criteria? Only individual or collective, that's not enough. Andreas? 
I mean, uh, uh, <clears throat> to make it concrete, yeah, and the, the, uh, an important sector is the mobility sector. Yeah? Uh, 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 and when you talk about uh, the good life, uh, then uh, definitely in continuation what, what Richard said, it's, uh, uh, we have a system that's very strongly based uh, on uh, uh, private property of cars yeah? mm -hmm. and the related individualized uh, uh, mode of mobility, which produces uh, cities and neighborhoods uh, that make it very difficult uh, to organize social provisioning. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. the alternative, uh, uh, and that's a context specific alternative for the mobility sector with a lot of research and all this, uh, is on the one hand uh, an improved public sector, yeah? but you are right that it's not only uh, public transport. Uh, there are also individual forms of mobility like walking uh, uh, and cycling, which in the case of the mobility system complement uh, collective provision, but uh, for walking and cycling, you need collective uh, infrastructures, which means that you have to uh, green the city and they reorganize and, and expulse the cars from, from neighborhoods. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So uh, th that's also, I would say, a strength of the foundational approach that it it does not give a, uh, or does not aim primarily at, a, a, at one answer, but tries to give context specific answers, uh, uh, which in the mobility sector is probably very different from the health sector, yeah, where you have uh, yeah, other forms of how to uh, organize this well. But it, again, it emerges out of uh, of experience from professionals, from from citizens, and from from researchers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a question from the audience. I have Fabienne on my speaking list. Yes. At first, thank you for all the interesting inputs to all the speakers. Um, after we have talked about uh, the foundational economy more closely, I would have a question for the caring in economies, because um, perhaps you, you said, okay, you're not yet there on the ways how society will tra tra transform, but perhaps um, you are all um, pretty um, good scientists and you know a lot about it. What are your thinkings about um, good care within um, planetary boundaries, because that's like, I know it's a huge question, but uh, it's at least the topic of our discussion today. So I would also be interested to get your ideas on this topic. Thank you. Thanks a lot for those big questions that really gives you, Maren, Ulrike, Anna, and or um, Adel had the possibility to do some um, yeah, think about some utopias for um, care with planetary boundaries, good care for all. I saw Anna first and then Ulrike. Yeah, um, maybe it was uh, my bad or my fault that um, that Fabienne took from um, from the discussion that the um, network carrying economy is not there yet with the formulation of concrete aspects. What I want to say is that that was a strategic choice to formulate criteria or logics for this transformation like democratic discussions and there are many more and um, but what I want to raise earlier when looking to the foundation economy and its strategy is um, well an attempt at self critique whether this was a good strategic choice, especially in the light of time pressure. So, but you are very right in, in, in asking what could um, other provisioning systems look like when we, um, when we enter this debate of net, the network carrying economy. And I think um, the um, other members of the network and the older members are much more, um, will, can say much more about this, but um, maybe I can still start. So, First of all, we need more caring jobs because um, there is this tendency that caring jobs are not as resource intensive as other jobs in, for example, in fossil industries. And this is, it's just a proxy, but it's important to take into account. So when we think about metabolisms, investing in caring jobs creates jobs and reduces emissions, and that's important. 
to care is is also important because um, it's an attitude or um, uh, a set of principles that really leaves behind green growth solutionism and that leads us out of this paradigm and that's really really important because green growth solutionism keeps us thinking that there are solutions to be found for example in bogus technologies but that's not the case and there's really this um, element of looking behind the veil or looking behind the theater of green growth um, that the network carrying economy is trying to do and what's also very important, and Adelheid will speak about this, I guess, more because you already raised your hand, is reproductivity. And for example, for ecological systems, for how we deal with landscapes, um, supporting reproductivity or even making sure that reproduction is possible, mm -hmm. it, it should be a no brainer, but it's not happening in practice. And we need this understanding of the logics of reproductivity to point out the problem. For example, soil degradation, climate change. If we don't know about reproductivity, these are um, problems that you can put in little boxes, but it's actually the logic of, well, destructing mm. reproductivity that ties them all together. And that, that is really the important mm. um, perspective or, or flashlight or torch that the, that the network caring economy is trying to shine on all the um, ways that economics has been done before. Thanks, Anna, Ulrike, and some other Yes, uh, I think um, good care is a um, really important question and uh, looking uh, sustainable uh, good care uh, is exactly what we have to discuss, but um, um, and, and care migration and uh, the, the ethical problems uh, Eva Kitte has this uh, great articles about the moral harm of care migration. And um, yeah, we have a lot of ethical questions um, behind all this um, and the gender relations in care work and intersectional um, perspectives, so on and so on. But what I would like to repeat, um, I said it very briefly um, in my presentation, um, is that for Zonglis Wirtschaft and caring economy um, is not care economics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is really important because um, for Zorge, um, some people of us, some members of the network were really against taking this care debate inside, which I think is, is important, but just to give an understanding that caring economy has this caring activities and the ecological processes, both as the basis of industrial processes, ICE model again. Um, and some of us of the network were really concentrated on the ecological processes and the societal uh, understanding of nature and so on and so on. And the care perspective was uh, quite some time outside of the discussions um, in the network. And so uh, bringing it back inside and bringing it together with, um, yeah, with uh, the future on this planet is, um, is really important. Yes. Thanks, Ulrike, Adelheid, and then Richard. Okay, um, two answers. A small one, uh, we have examples for good care systems today. We know it from um, the Netherlands where you have small caring teams, uh, they care in the neighborhood. And we have uh, examples where the village, uh, the village uh, takes the task to care for the elderly. So uh, these are systems where uh, the persons need time, need caring persons, need special materials as Maren explained. So uh, that's possible. And th this means that uh, they are decentralized um, systems. But my main answer is um, similar to Ulrike. Uh, our caring economy also belong, uh, refers to market. Uh, the principles of Vorsorge cooperation and of um, orientation to a good life are principles for, for every economic action. 
uh, if we change, we want to change, but we want also to, to change the markets to develop these principles as uh, guiding principles. And uh, I agree with the fundamental um, um, e economic group uh, that um, we could start, for example, to reduce working time. Because I always say we have no time enough for such a lot of working time. We have to do a lot of other things. So we need time. It would, would be a first step, a really concrete first step. And the second step would be to make clear that uh, men uh, take the half of the caring activities to make, uh, to, to, uh, to make clear what it means uh, to do these activities. So then women and men do the same things and then they speak about the same thing with the same language. And then you can uh, go on and go on. So co two concrete steps, for example, but the main thing is to make clear that uh, for Sorge, to have a look to the future and to have a look to nature's uh, capability of reproductivity and uh, cooperation and so on. They are principles for the whole economy. This means we are a very anti-capitalistic concept. Yes, uh, it's, other things are not, not possible because if we leave the markets, also small markets in the capitalist way, we know what they are doing for the whole world. We see it in Africa, we see it uh, over the whole world. That's the answer. So we, we, uh, we can explain concrete, uh, concrete um, examples, for example, the, the commons movement today, they uh, develop their concrete uh, concepts, how they live and how they care for uh, elderly and children and so on, or other, other concrete groups who try to make clear it's uh, possible to work <clears throat> in a, to live in another, <clears throat> in another way, <clears throat> also in the capitalistic uh, system. <clears throat> But the, <clears throat> the main task is to make clear that this, these markets uh, are not, it's not possible to, to create a sustainable future based on these markets, as small as they would be, because they were small in the beginning, and they, um, they will develop and develop and expand and expand. That's the problem. And then I come at the last sentence. The problem is um, I come back to the individual, the ideas we have in our heads uh, when we grow up. We, we are used to the system and we shall be individuals. We shall optimize our capabilities and so on and so on. And our educational system has to be very, very reformed to make clear that individuals think in another way. But it's a big, big uh, task, and I don't want to give the uh, this task to another field. I'm an economist, and I work in my field. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Adelheid. Um, Richard, you also raised your hand, and maybe just before a disclaimer, if anybody in the audience still has a question after Richard speaks, will be the last possibility to voice it because then we're closing for final statements. Richard. Yeah, maybe also a reaction to, to Anna, because I think it's very important what you said um, in terms of, of um, care and degrowth. And I might agree with you because you said that de definancialization, decommodification of our foundational system is important, but it might be a drop in the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, but even if it's a drop in the ocean, I think it's the precondition for any further step. Why? Because um, for many reasons, actually, but one main reason is that if we decommodify and definancialize our foundation provisioning systems, mm -hmm. this also means that we somehow decouple livelihood security from wage work a bit. And this then links to, to the ability for working time reductions, for example. Mm -hmm. But it also links to the fact that we do not, we're not forced to work in, in jobs in the like, capitalist part of the economy to produce things that we don't need to then get the money to afford those things that we need that were before privatized or basically enclosed in some way. Mm -hmm. So by declosing or 
you know, the, the opposite of enclosing the commons. And I think the privatization of the foundation economy was a form of, in, of enclosure, basically. Mm -hmm. By reversing this process, um, we also create a precondition for, for any further step. And in that sense, I think the definitionalization and decommodification might be a uh, very important um, yeah. drop in the ocean. Thanks a lot, Richard. And thank you, everybody, for your contributions. Um, I would now like to, as we're approaching eight o'clock, I would now, um, against the background of all what we have heard, also as many commonalities and really, of, I, I think it's such a privilege and something that should happen so much more often in academia to take the time to bring representatives of different networks together, or as Ulrike mentioned before, to network the network, so to say, and see what um, we can learn from each other. We saw that there is a lot of um, commonalities that we can draw upon synergies that hopefully will be built upon more even in the future. As um, Andreas has mentioned um, in the Foundational Economy Conferences here in Vienna, care is actually a quite big topic. So mm -hmm. there are a number of sessions about it and it's a, a core topic. So what I would like to ask you for um, the final question are some final statements of no longer than a minute or one and a half minutes of what's your key takeaway from today? Like, with regard to this conversation and the dialogue with either the network caring economy or the foundational economy collective, what's maybe a key takeaway or a final thought that you will take with you and possibly also share with other network members? I know it's a big question to think of now, so I'm not going to appoint anybody, um, but maybe the first person who wants to start with their final statements um, raises their hand. Is there anything? Okay. No. Um, Andreas. Go oh. ahead, Andreas. As I have uh, insisted on so many commonalities, uh, listening to you, perhaps uh, there is one difference, and I have to reflect on this, that my ethical approach might be more pragmatic yeah, than, uh, than what you presented. So it's more inspired by what is possible here and now uh, and less by uh, criteria of, uh, uh, of a good society or good economy. Yeah? But I have to reflect on this, but you mm -hmm. asked for learnings uh, and, and definitely that's something for me to reflect on. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Andreas. Adelheid, your final thoughts. Um, two sentences. The first one, uh, I I think uh, you every every network has a, a special foundation in literature. We come from the feminist debate, and I think you don't uh, refer to the feminist debates. We, we have really different different uh, history of economic thought, if you want to say it in the way. Uh, one one thing. The other is what I learn and what I I'm very interested in is uh, your uh, your thinking about the future. I I, I call it a sustainable future infrastructure uh, because it's clear a good good caring economic system with different markets, other markets than today, and uh, different other organizations and principles. Again, um, uh, principles making clear that we work in a reproductive uh, community um, needs an uh, entirely different infrastructure than today. And this, this uh, thinking about infrastructure is a very, very interesting thing. And I think also in our network, we should start to think about a, a sustainable reproductive infrastructure. Great. Thanks a lot, Adelheid. Who wants to go next? Final statement, Ulrike. Um, yeah, I think it uh, was a really good start of a discussion we should uh, continue. Um, and uh, I would like to be a little more prepared next time, it's my fault, um, in um, foundational economy. And um, 
I know there is almost no time to read anymore, not because we have all <laughs> so much to do, that's the one thing, but um, it's, yeah, we, we have to, to act, re act and react. We have so much to do, it's uh, almost no time to read, but what would be, I uh, showed the, the um, publications of the Network Caring Economy, but what would be the publication on uh, uh, foundational economy would be perhaps also interesting for the others. And because because I saw um, one question in the chat um, about the, the conference going on tomorrow or starting tomorrow. I think that's open um, for everybody. And um, the, the um, meeting of the um, network caring economy end of October is not open to the public. Uh, we have a special process. You could get a member, but it takes some time. So you cannot just show up in end of the October. So that's it. But perhaps the publication, the one you could just um, add in the chat, that would be very helpful, not for me alone, but for others as well, I think. If there is one, I'm not quite sure. We know this uh, economy, this Alltagslebens, perhaps this is it already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ulrike. Maybe just to add on that, um, first a network meeting end of October, so there will be a public event on Saturday afternoon that we will also, um, Saturday evening that we will also communicate about. So that's a part to get to know the network's members that come to Vienna. And about a publication, I actually, um, I'm going to post in a second, um, my favorite publication of on foundational economy, which is actually by Andreas Richard and Leonhard Blank, because I think they did a very great paper, I think in 2021, which actually takes care much more into account than most of the other foundational economy um, papers and books I know. So I'm going to definitely post um, the link to this one. And hand over to the next person, Anna. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I can end with some things that I keep will keep reflecting on. So I think um, it, although it's um, as Andrea said that the language around foundation economy and network caring economy is very appealing because it really connects to lived experiences of many people. It can, can be quite painful to really adopt an attitude of caring because to care means to acknowledge that, mm -hmm. um, that actually governments today do not have the climate crisis under control mm -hmm. and that hurts and that leaves people feel very lost. It also means to acknowledge that corporate, the corporate power that the fossil fuel industry holds is actually um, expanding even in our times and this continued exercise of power will make caring on a daily basis harder in the future it will be will make harder that we care for each other it will make harder that we care with natures and yep. my question looking to um, the network foundation economy is or that i take away with how can the foundational economy perspective help in redistributing this kind of power to where it makes more sense and where it um, really enables us to to save um, what we need for human flourishing, which is reproduction. Thank you, Anna. Richard? Can I continue? Yeah. So maybe in terms of practical next, step, next steps, we're currently working on, on a little project already for a while um, on metrics of livability. So the, the main critique of the foundation economy on current metrics was basically the critique on income. So to take income as a measure of livability is, is simply insufficient. And therefore the Foundation Economy Collective introduced this idea of residual income, which is basically post-tax disposable household income minus the costs of household essentials, such as you know, utilities, housing, transport, and so on. Mm -hmm. And these expanded metrics try to you know, strike a balance between money and market income on the one hand and access to foundational infrastructures on the other hand. So it, it importantly also highlighted that success in income terms does not deliver livability if housing, transport, and utility costs are disproportionately high. So now you have these two components. But now our, our next step would be that to extend this metric because we argue that actually there is at least three main pillars um, for livability. That is money, access to foundational infrastructures, and distribution of time. So we need to also bring in um, time studies into this, into this metric to develop a, a multi-dimensional 
um, indicator of livability. And I think this is um, hard also because there's a lack of, of time use studies. Um, the last one, we now have a new one in Austria soon, but the last one is I think 10 years old or so. But I think this is really also where the networks could work together to, to develop the residual income indicator, which I think is an important one, further by integrating the logic of time in it, and especially the, the logic of distributing time and um, more equally. Thanks, Richard. Maren, you want to have some final words? Yes. Um... I, I share many of the things already said. I, I also think it would be fruitful to continue the discussion between the two networks. Um, I also share the importance of having a gender perspective, an intersectional gender perspective, including all genders, within the discussion, because I think um, as we say, you know, what, um, what is not sustainable cannot be economic, uh, what is not socially sustainable cannot be economic, but what is also not gender uh, orient oriented towards uh, gender equality uh, is also not very economic in the sense we would like to understand the economy. So maybe I end with kind of challenges to both networks. And I think that's the intersectional perspective. It's also for future discussion, uh, reflecting on our own standpoints. I mean, including what geographical area we refer to, what uh, economies we take as analytical starting points, uh, according to what pictures of, uh, what understandings of nature and of humankind and of society we have. Um, because I think that these are not easy questions, but it would make it easier to understand each other's perspectives and also one own, one's own limitations. Thanks a lot, Maren, for um, those last final thoughts. And thank you, everyone, really. I found the conversation we had really very insightful and inspiring and I hope it's only the starting point um, for more conversation, more synergies, more integration also of knowledge that already is there. And with this, I would like to end today's webinar. I'm once again briefly sharing, not this slide, I'm sorry, the slide with the next webinars and we hope that you can make it to our next webinar on October 11th, Transition Towards a Caring Society. Um, thanks a lot, everyone, for bearing with us until 8 p.m. And um, have a good night. Goodbye. <laughs>